Hello everyone. So in this tutorial we're going to build on what we spoke about in the last tutorial regarding classification of matter. Because if you recall in that particular tutorial we discussed how we make decisions based on properties as to whether we decide that a sample of matter happens to be an element, a compound, or a mixture. And so if we're going to be able to classify matter consistently and understand what a sample of matter can do, then we also have to be very good at understanding the properties of matter. Now the properties of matter can sort of be categorized and classified a number of different ways. But in this particular tutorial, we're going to focus our attention on understanding the difference between physical properties of matter and chemical properties of matter. Now, when it comes to physical properties of matter, it's essentially just any characteristic of a sample of matter that I can observe without changing the identity of the sample of matter. So, for example, a common physical property is its state, so the state of matter. And what I mean by that, is it a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Now, for example, suppose that the sample of matter that I'm studying is a cube of ice. Well, that I can understand and appreciate that the cube of ice is a solid does not change that I'm looking at a cube of ice. And so for that reason, the state of matter for that cube of ice would be considered a physical property. Similarly, the size of a sample of matter also is considered a physical property. So for example, if I have something that I can measure the length for, or measure or calculate its area, or its volume, all of these characteristics I can measure and observe without changing the identity of the sample of matter. So if I'm, once again, studying an ice cube, if I can measure the sides of the cube, I can calculate the volume and I can do all of that without changing the identity of the cube and changing that it's made out of ice. Similarly, all right, the shape of the sample of matter is another physical property. So if I, again, note that I have a cube in front of me, as opposed to a sphere, as opposed to a cylinder, then once again, that's something that I've been able to observe without actually changing what that sample of matter is made of. This also applies to the color, or I'll put also here lack of color, of a substance. For example, cubes tend to be colorless. If they're made out of water and there's no food coloring in the water, then basically ice cubes are essentially transparent. But again, my being able to appreciate that and understand that and observe that in that sample of matter does not, again, change the identity of that sample of matter. Now, if any of these things change, then we call that associated change a physical change. So, for example, if I cut a piece of paper, well, I'm changing the size of this piece of paper, but the fact that I've cut it doesn't change that this is still paper. And so that's an example of a physical change. If I paint something, all right, so basically underneath this green paint is wood, all right? If I paint it green, then I've changed the color of the wood. But that doesn't change the fact that underneath that coat of green paint, there is still wood present there. And so once again, that makes this a physical change. Here, right, down here at the bottom, and it's kind of hard to see, is dry ice. And dry ice is really just carbon dioxide in its solid form. Okay, now inside the beaker is also some water. Right, but if I'm considering what's happening to the carbon dioxide, the water is heating up the solid carbon dioxide so that basically I'm giving off carbon dioxide gas. At the start of the process, I have carbon dioxide. At the end of the process, I have carbon dioxide again. What I have changed is I've changed the state of the carbon dioxide. 
but I haven't changed the identity. I still have carbon dioxide before and after the process. And so as a result, that's considered to be physical change. All right, another example of a similar change is water freezing. If I have water that's freezing, then basically I have water in its liquid form to start. And at the end of the process, I have water in its solid form. I have water at the beginning and water at the end. What I've done is similar to the previous example, is I've changed the state of the water. But I still have the same water before and after. And so as a result, that's considered to be a physical change. Now, not all properties are physical properties. We also have what we consider to be chemical properties. Now, chemical properties are different from physical properties in that when you observe a chemical property, you're observing the identity of the state of matter also changing. You're not going to have the same substance or collection of substances in the beginning of the process that you do at the end. And so an example of a chemical property is flammability or the ability to burn. All right, there's also rusting. Okay, when iron rusts, once again, that also represents an ability to react with oxygen. By the way, burning is also a reaction with oxygen. There's also corrosion. Corrosion and rusting are very similar. But basically, again, it's the ability of metals to react with other substances. All, right, all of these are chemical properties. The ability of that state of matter that you're studying to react with something else. Notice again that in each case, a reaction or a chemical transformation is happening. And a demonstration of any of these properties is usually something that we see when a chemical change is going on. So, for example, here I have coal burning. All right, again, this represents a reaction with oxygen. All right, so again, the flammability of the coal is a chemical property, and the process by which I witness that chemical property would be a chemical change. Here, we have a sample of iron rusting. Okay, a reaction with oxygen present in water. Okay, and notice that at the beginning of the process, I have iron. And iron's chemical symbol is Fe. When the process is over, I have rust. And rust is a chemical compound that has a formula Fe2O3. So the stuff I have at the beginning is different from the stuff that I have at the end. And so that's what makes this a chemical change. Also, just sort of as an example, and I'm not sure how many of you guys were aware, but actually the Statue of Liberty was never, was not originally green. I mean, we know it to look like this now, but essentially right after it was constructed, it actually had more of a brown sort of coppery color because it was made of copper. And copper's chemical formula is Cu. But over a period of about 30 years or so, basically what's happened is because of the exposure to the elements, then you have this green coating, all right, that has sort of covered the copper that the Statue of Liberty is made out of. And this green stuff is called patina. And this patina is composed of something called copper carbonate. And again, don't worry about the formulas for now. We'll 
cover later in the year how you can actually write these formulas yourself from you know the name of a compound but what I want you to note here is notice that again the stuff that we had at the beginning of the process is different from the stuff that we had at the end and so because of that then this process that the Statue of Liberty has undergone is considered to be a chemical change so let's go through some additional examples of identifying physical and chemical changes so if I'm dissolving lemonade mix in water okay well basically I have my lemonade ingredients which are again lemon juice and sugar in solid form to start and then I'm dissolving it in which case I'll have lemonade but this time in a liquid form and so notice that we have lemonade in the beginning and lemonade at the end all we've done is we've changed the state all right since we've just changed the state then this is considered a physical change okay now what about fireworks exploding well if things are exploding then you can also be sure that burning is part of the process all right we can even see the flames in the picture and so the components of the fireworks are burning all right which is an example of a reaction with oxygen Trying to make this a little neater reaction with oxygen and so since I'm describing how the components of the fireworks are reacting with another element then this is an example of a chemical change now let's take one more example let's consider frying an egg now this particular example is a little bit trickier than the others we've just done because it is true that you're starting the process with a liquid egg and you're ending the process with a solid egg this isn't just a simple change of state because what's going on within the egg is that you're actually breaking bonds within the proteins okay now as it turns out once the cooking process is over you've formed new bonds within the proteins that are present in the egg and it's this formation of oops sorry the formation of new bonds and the breaking of old bonds that actually make this a chemical change so though there is a physical change component to the process because you are going from a liquid to a solid it's also accompanied by a chemical change because within the actual substance of the egg itself you're breaking old bonds with uh, between the proteins that make up the egg and you're forming new bonds between the proteins now this process is actually called denaturation and it's that denaturation process that makes this also a chemical change so we'll be doing more of these examples in class tomorrow where you guys will take a look at pictures and study processes and decide whether or not a process is a physical or a chemical change if you have any questions again email tonight if there's time or if not speak to me tomorrow in class and we'll go and we'll clear up any misunderstandings you might have all right so i'll see you guys in class